Hi, everyone, and welcome to this Time 100 talk. I'm uh, Charlie Campbell, East Asia Correspondent for Time. I'm delighted today to welcome Mr. Ban Ki-moon, who served as the Eighth Secretary General of the United Nations for two terms from 2007 to 2016. Mr. Ban, thank you for joining us today. Very grateful for your time. Thank you. It's a great pleasure and honor for me to be with you today. Fantastic. Um, I understand you're in Seoul, Korea at the moment? Yes, I'm staying at this time in Korea, and I have been staying during the last uh, three months, uh, four, and now it is the fourth month that I have been locked down in Korea. Uh, in, it is quite uh, <clears throat> worrisome that this kind of uh, lockdown continues still, uh, while this, uh, we are living in a 21st century, hyper-connected, uh, interconnected world. I hope that uh, soon we'll be able to uh, freely travel, move around, and meet and people and talk. Well, absolutely. I love visiting Seoul myself, and so I look forward to coming over and, and perhaps meeting you there one day uh, soon. Um, we would love to talk a little bit about the South Korean coronavirus response uh, later on in the conversation, but perhaps to start, we might talk about your uh, Ban Ki-moon Foundation for a Better Future, um, which I understand you set up with an aim of encouraging global citizenship. Um, why do you think that is so important? During my 10-year service as a Secretary General of the United Nations, I have met a numerous number of uh, political and economic uh, business leadership and civil society leaders. I'm now going to talk about political leaders of uh, major countries, national leaders. What I have found during the last 10 years is that largely, largely, these political leaders who claim to be global leaders, lack a global vision, global citizenship. That is why the first thing I have done was to establish a Ban Ki-moon Center for Global Citizens in Vienna, Austria, where one of the four headquarters of the UN is located. And then May last year in Korea, I have established the Ban Ki-moon Foundation uh, for a Better Future. These two organizations carrying my name are mutually reinforcing, reinforcing to promote and raise global citizenship. Global citizens are those who identify as the member of the nation, but instead as a member of humanity more largely. And they look beyond the national borders, a narrow prism of uh, national and personal and political interest. Mostly they are engaging in short-term political gains. This is not what we need uh, as leaders. We are very closely interconnected world with a lot of global challenges, like uh, starting with climate change, sustainable development, eradicating abject poverty, global health, like uh, COVID-19. This is something which we have to mobilize a full global citizenship with a compassion and solidarity and sense of unity. But I'm sorry to tell you that largely uh, we are embarrassed that such kind of a global leadership is absent in uh, most of the countries, particularly in one of the most important uh, countries. Absolutely, uh, because it seems that while you're trying to foster global le leadership, there has been a wor worrying, sorry, there's been a worrisome uh, rise in nationalism uh, across the world and in many, many countries. Um, how worrying is that for global peace and prosperity? This uh, <coughs> global rise in uh, nationalism is uh, deeply, uh, deeply concerning and has ushered in a new period of unpredictability and risk that threatens both international peace and security and sustainable development and human rights and particularly those um, uh, vulnerable group of people. Populist skepticism and anger on globalization, institutions, experts, even on science and also the fact, very facts, has fueled many of uh, the seismic geopolitical changes uh, we have witnessed in recent years. This included notably, I'm sorry to say this, uh, 
President Donald Trump of the United States and the Brexit in the European Union and some Yellow Vest in France. And there are many uh, such uh, leaders. Such events share many underlying uh, connective threats such as frustration with inequality, manifestations of uh, xenophobia, and the resurgence of nationalism. And as nationalism spread, continue to grow, make electoral gains around the world, a whole new set of uh, challenges has emerged. Trade wars, the free trade is uh, hindered and hurting the global economy, refugees and migrants. We have more than 75 million refugees and migrants. This is the highest number since the end of the Second World War. Human rights are being undercut and the critical multilateral institutions and agreements are at risk like the climate change agreement. These dynamics are making it harder uh, to solve, resolve the conflicts. At a time when we need the solidarity and unity much, much more than we are losing our capacity, our limited capacity uh, to handle all global issues. And, and of course, um, during your time in charge of the UN, you sought to combat global challenges such as uh, climate change, uh, spearheading initiatives such as the Paris Climate Agreement. Uh, the US has withdrawn from the Paris Pact and has announced its intention to defund the WHO. It has withdrawn from the uh, UN Human Rights Council and um, at the moment there's a growing momentum towards even withdrawing from the World Trade Organization. Um, how damaging is US disengagement from global affairs? Are we reaching a crisis point? United States is the most powerful in every aspect, every standard and the most resourceful. And the United States has been leading uh, this world, particularly since the end of Second World War, with the fundamental values enshrined in the chart of the United Nations. That is peace and global peace and security, and the sustainable, equitable development, and also human rights for all. Now, uh, embarrassingly, uh, we are seeing some absence of American leadership uh, since the administration of uh, Donald Trump began. Now, the United States has withdrawn from the uh, United Nations Human Rights Commission. American people, leadership has been based on universal human rights. And they have withdrawn from uh, UNESCO. They have also withdrawn from a major international agreement, starting from Paris Climate Change Agreement and the JCPOA, Iranian nuclear deals. And they have also canceled this INF, um, Intermediate Nuclear Forces. I am very much afraid to say that at the time, American leadership is most needed. Americans are now backtracking. Uh, from uh, this kind of uh, world ch challenges. Absolutely, but I mean, some of the criticism which has been le leveled at um, international institutions such as the UN from uh, President Trump, uh, is there any validity in this criticism? Is there a, a real argument that uh, these international institutions need to be reformed? International organizations uh, can be as effective and strong as much as the member states support them. There is a clear lack of resources. Only member states' uh, financial and technical uh, support. Can the United Nations Secretary General or Director General of WHO can work to address all these global uh, challenges, including pandemic and peace and security in uh, many conflict zones? And protect those vulnerable group of people whose human rights are being abused. Now, the United States and China, they are two great powers in terms of economy, as well as in terms of military. And they respect their status as such they are. But now they are now 
in at confronting each other. And I sincerely hope that the uh, United States, particularly as a global number one global power, uh, should lead this world with much more uh, reasonable and active uh, support uh, for the organization. And I don't think it is fair uh, to criticize the WHO. WHO is uh, one of the specialized agencies, 16 specialized agencies, and they are focusing on global health and security. Now, after four months of uh, uh, pandemic uh, erupted, the Security Council has never been able to take any single decision because of the confrontation between United States and the China. This is a sad, this is sad. They should feel the sense of global responsibility to be recognized as a global leader. Global leadership cannot just stay there. They should lead by example. Other than serving as foreign minister, you were also formerly chief national security advisor to the South Korean president, and both roles involve working closely in North Korea. President Trump has switched from a hostile approach to Kim Jong-un to unprecedented engagement. But in recent months, Pyongyang has resumed firing rockets. Is engagement still the correct course? I think uh, diplomacy is uh, still will be the best approach, uh, dealing with North Korean and nuclear issues and uh, the reconciliation between the South and uh, North Korea. As while the first year of uh, President Trump was uh, a very uh, dangerous uh, uh, relations between North Korea and uh, the United States, and there was nothing uh, no movement even between South and, and North Korea. The robust Republic of Korea security cooperation and maintenance of the UN Security Council sanctions, etc., has really helped to maintain the stability, the stability of the Korean Peninsula at, until at this time. Now, with the three times of summit meeting, one-on-one -on -one meeting with uh, a chairman Kim Jong Un of North Korea, uh, President Trump uh, has been made able to make a good contribution. Con contribution, but at this time, unfortunately, by just granting just the one-on-one -on -one summit the three times with the President Trump and the Kim Jong Un, perhaps uh, playing to his ego and penchant for pageantry, uh, Kim Jong Un seems to have succeeded in acquiring the de facto nuclear state status. This is uh, some, something which I am very much worried. The United States has been changing their position when it comes to denuclearization. First, they said the CBID, complete, verifiable, irreversible denuclearization. Then, then now, uh, sometimes uh, they change the FF for BD, and the President uh, Trump has been saying that uh, just, you know, it's okay that, that they are testing some a small range of uh, missiles. Uh, it, it cannot reach the American continent. It's not only the security and safety of American continent. It is the safety and security and threat to whole humanity once North Korea uses nuclear weapons. It is known fact that they have already uh, stockpiling at least 20 to 60 nuclear weapons in their own hands. And they have never declared, even though they declared and signed with President Moon Jae-in in Panmunjom in 2018, that they would adhere to denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. But they have never implemented that uh, uh, you know, agreement. That is why we are very much uh, worried, worried about this. And this is much to the detriment uh, to the long established and collective efforts by the international community, including the UN Security Council to achieve denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. At this time, now I'm particularly worried that North Korea's recent uh, resumption of missile testing, that is quite concerning. And the May 4th terror, a glimpse of uh, renewed tensions Ahead. But I'm also 
encouraged by the fact that the um, diplomatic process technically remains uh, open and has not uh, collapsed completely. And your country, uh, South Korea, had um, a very robust um, technology-driven response to the coronavirus pandemic, um, building on its, its quite uh, uh, frightful experience with the MERS um, epidemic when it was uh, the second worst hit country after Saudi Arabia. Um, is it possible, do you think, for to just strengthen global institutions to build on a South Korean um, coronavirus response to perhaps create a blueprint to... Of course, um, of course Korea is ready to share with other members of the international community the expertise and know-how and experiences. Uh, Korea's recent history with the pandemic disease uh, deal dealing with um, SARS in 2002 and the MERS in 2015 has undoubtedly a better prepared to, uh, for us to combat uh, COVID-19. Mask wearing has already uh, been ingrained in the lives of the Korean people, but the government's very aggressive, aggressive uh, response related to what they call three things, like a testing and uh, <coughs> tracing and treatment has been particularly effective in keeping cases, hospitalizations, and death relatively low. Now, that's why Korean government is uh, actively seeking to exchange our uh, experience, a uh, shared experience and know-how with other developing countries. As a former Secretary General, I joined many global former global leaders urging G20 leaders, and I signed it, to do much more for Global South in Africa, in other countries, where they would not have capacity. They would not have even the capacity to test the low, relatively low, number, low numbers of patients and death numbers are because of their inability to check, verify, verify. And therefore, Korea is now ready to work with the United Nations and WHO, and I believe that there are many lessons to be learned that could be replicated from the lessons of the Korean people. Uh, Korean people. But I can caution you that there is no such one size fits all. But at least, at least uh, we can share our experiences. Of course. And it seems that countries with populist leaders looking at the US and Brazil seem to have suffered um, disproportionately badly during this coronavirus pandemic. And um, a lot of these populist leaders take aim at international institutions like the UN. Um, why do you think there is such a rise of populism across the globe, uh, the globe at the moment? As I, as I said uh, earlier, attacks on the UN or international organizations are nothing new. Now, they are... Uh, using the anger of uh, people on the ground. Uh, this is uh, quite uh, worrisome. The rise of populist nationalism over the last few years has dovetailed with the anger at institutions, globalizations, inequality, and perceived demographic uh, threats as a result of uh, migration and refugee issues. Because the global leaders have not done enough uh, for all those hapless people who have to flee their country for a better opportunity. Then there is only a uh, rise of uh, anger. That is the problem now. Now, opportunistic uh, leaders and politicians in the United States and Europe uh, and Southeast Asia and uh, Latin America have exploited these convergences, as well as other related uh, uh, climate action and gender inequality to frame uh, globalism uh, related to, you know, and the United Nations be proxy as an enemy to nationhood and the traditional values. Sadly, levels of xenophobia, racism, anti-Semitism, and sexism have dangerously increased all over the world uh, in tandem. Now, despite such uh, disheartening developments, we must always remember 
uh, that global problems require global solution. There is not a single country or individual, however powerful, however resourceful one may be, can handle these uh, global uh, global problems at this time. On top of your work at the UN, you're also a South Korean foreign minister and a diplomat, and you have postings in New Delhi and Vienna and Washington, D.C., I understand. Um, the current Trump administration advocates the policy of America first, but insists it does not mean America alone. As a former diplomat, do you find that reassuring? Is it possible to have both? I'm also very uh, uh, worried and concerned about this uh, or country first, like America uh, first uh, uh, policies like that. We are living in a small planet Earth, hyper interconnected world. There is no place where we cannot reach within 24 hours by airplanes. That is a matter of a second, fraction of a second. We can communicate like we are doing now. Then when only one country wants to live alone, then that means that this country will, will fail. Since the election of President uh, Donald Trump in uh, 2016 and 17, I'm afraid that this America first policy has in fact isolated the United States on the global stage. And in practice, does not look more like America alone. The US has decided from all this major, major global agreement, which I have already elaborated. This is a really a serious problem. And I'm really urging American leadership to really look back what has happened uh, what has is now what is now happening in global world when there is an absence of American leadership, there will be more nationalism and more uh, terrorism and more you know what abuse of human rights, more regional uh, conflicts. Make no mistake, make no mistake. Other powers such as China and Russia are also taking notes very seriously and trying to fill the political vacuum the United States would be out of this scene, then I'm really urging U.S. should look at this uh, situation very, very uh, seriously. International co cooperation is the glue that binds everybody together. Nationalism and protectionism are simply not viable alternatives to cooperation and the partnership. Uh, and the latest um, sort of area of dispute between Beijing and Washington is the status of semi-autonomous Hong Kong um, and the ambition there of uh, new national security legislation and um, some debates over its continued um, economic um, special status. Uh, do you think that an international institution like the UN could help mediate disputes like this or is that beyond dispute? I hope that UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres will uh, be able to play a certain role in this very uh, worrisome situation between two big powers, China and the United States. I have been uh, uh, closely monitoring the current situation uh, in Hong Kong with a great concern as a former Secretary General. And, and as one of the global citizens, the acute political confrontation uh, between the United States and China is another worrisome example of the nationalism falling apart. First of all, it is of utmost importance that the current situation be resolved in a peaceful manner and that uh, Hong Kong continues to enjoy and prosper to advance under the one country, two uh, systems uh, framework. That means uh, Hong Kong's autonomy uh, should not be undermined. Freedom of expression and freedom of assembly uh, should be guaranteed. At the same time, any expression of uh, their anger or whatever through a demonstration uh, should be carried out in a peaceful way, peaceful way without disrupting law and order. At the same time, Basic human rights of the millions of Hong Kong citizens should be respected. I sincerely hope 
that there is a time for both the China and the United States to engage in each other, and they should take more prudent action before taking any unilateral uh, measure. Uh, Mr. Ban, I'm afraid we're out of time, but thank you so much for joining us uh, at Time Today. It's been a fascinating discussion, and I, I hope we can uh, talk again soon and uh, lock down lifts and you're able to continue your travel and your work uh, around the, uh, the region. Thank you very much for this opportunity. I hope uh, we'll be able to meet in person and engage in more dialogue in the next Absolutely. possible future. Thank you very much. I look forward to it. Thank you so much. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Bye -bye.